Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. Short and succinct questions and responses will enable us to get as many members in as possible. And at question number one, I call Liz Smith. My apologies. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions ministers have had with residential outdoor education centres regarding the provision of bed spaces for 2023. Minister Claire Hawhey. The Scottish Government values the benefits of outdoor learning for children and young people, and this includes the specific role of outdoor education centres. We have supported outdoor education centres with £4 million of COVID emergency funding to prevent closures during the COVID pandemic, as well as provided guidance to encourage and support visits by schools. Ministers, government officials and representatives of outdoor centres continue to discuss a wide range of issues relating to the sector on an ongoing basis. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the Minister and can I also thank the Scottish Government uh, for the assistance that it did provide to the outdoor education centres during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, uh, when many of them obviously couldn't uh, operate. Their problems have been eased, but by no means have they been eradicated. And I think it's very important that we have accurate data uh, as to exactly what facilities are available so that schools in particular can make informed decisions about where pupils can access residential facilities. So can I ask if the Scottish Government will undertake to do that in line with outdoor education centres? Minister. Um, I, I can provide um, Liz Smith with what we have in terms of the latest data that sector representatives have shared with officials and that indicates that there's a total capacity of 4,400 operational beds in around 50 centres across Scotland, but that doesn't cover the full capacity in the sector, and these bed capacity figures do not take into account seasonal availability. But we will continue to engage with the sector and look at how we can uh, more accurately ref reflect what is on offer to local authorities in their uh, bookings for schools and other organisations. Question number two, Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the number of Scottish domiciled students attending Scottish universities. Minister Jamie Hepburn. In the academic year 2020-21, the latest figures we have, there are a total of 180,170 Scottish domiciled students attending Scottish universities. Pam Russell. I thank the Minister for that answer. According to UCAS figures, since 2006, there has been a 56% increase in the number of people attending Scottish universities, but an 83% increase in the number of Scottish domiciled applicants denied a place. The SNP Green Administration claims to be on the side of Scotland, but the current model sees Scottish pupils short-changed. Does the Minister consider this problem as this a problem, and what action will it take to address it? Minister. Well, Ms Gosrell says the Scottish system leaves uh, Scottish students shortchanged. Let me tell her about the Scottish system. The Scottish system has delivered uh, 180,000 uh, Scottish domiciled uh, students in the last academic year. That's up from 167,030 uh, the year before. And it's delivering it on the basis of them not having to pay £9,000 per annum, as is the case under her uh, party's administration south of the border. And interestingly, in that regard, uh, President Officer, I couldn't help but notice uh, former Tory MP uh, Luke Graham's uh, article in The Times uh, this week on uh, headed Time to be Bold in National Education, where he said there now exists a unique opportunity for the new Prime Minister to hold the devolved governments to account. That sounds very much the unsubtle code uh, to me, inviting the UK government to introduce tuition fees here in Scotland. Bob Doris. Uh, President Officer, can I actually welcome the record number of Scottish domicile students who have secured a place at university? Let's not be negative, Ms Gossel. That's a testament to the hard work of students and teachers right across Scotland. But, Minister, can I ask how many of these new university students will come from deprived areas? Minister. Uh, well, what I can say to uh, Mr Doris right now in terms of the current uh, process, we don't have the final uh, numbers. We're still to go through the clearance process uh, as well, but there is uh, an indication uh, right now uh, that the uh, numbers of 18-year-olds uh, from uh, deprived areas securing uh, university places under the current uh, 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 year uh, as the stand is up 29% since 2019, the last year 
there were exams and we are making good progress in achieving our target of by 2030 having 20 percent of students from SIMD 20 areas there's been good year-on-year -year, uh, progress in that regard and indeed in Mr Doris's uh, home city we've seen significant uh, growth over that same period of uh, mentioned of 18 year olds uh, from those uh, areas attending the three universities in uh, his uh, city uh, up 15 percent at Glasgow Caledonian University up 22 percent uh, in the University of Strathclyde up 76 percent at the University of Glasgow that's the progress being made under this administration Willie Rennie uh, the minister's got to acknowledge however that there are many excellent Scottish students who are being deprived of place at Scottish universities because of the the cap on places is he saying that there is nothing he's going to do to resolve that problem? Does he not recognise that issue? And will he agree to meet with me to discuss it further? Minister. Well, on that last point, I'm always delighted to meet with Mr Rennie, so um, I'm happy to accept uh, his uh, uh, request and invite to, to do so. It has always been the case that, of course, there are uh, people who want to apply to university who unfortunately do not uh, manage to access uh, university. That's always uh, very disappointing for those individuals. Incidentally, it's not a unique phenomenon here uh, in Scotland. It happens in other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom as well. Not every person who applies to university in England, Wales or Northern Ireland accesses university. But I would reflect on the fact, uh, and I've already made the point, that we have 180,000 uh, Scottish domicile students being supported uh, into uh, Scottish universities under the current uh, system. That's up on the figures before. That's a good uh, direction of travel. They're not having to pay to do so and that's a record of achievement I'm proud of. Question number three, Michael Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had and has planned with the University of Dundee's management team regarding the reported pensions dispute between the University and trade unions representing staff. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Yeah, I meet regularly with university principals in the campus trade unions and industrial action is often one of the items discussed. Since the beginning of this particular dispute, I've engaged with the principal of the University of Dundee regularly, as well with the unions at uh, the University of Dundee. I've written again to Professor Ian Gillespie this week to encourage the university and its workforce representatives to come back together to resolve the current issues. Michael Mara. I welcome that intervention from the Minister. He will remember that I have raised this issue with him on numerous occasions over the last year. But on the 25th of August, the majority of Dundee University Court voted to impose cuts to the pensions of their lowest paid employees. Unite members are now on all-out strike action with permanent pickets. Unison members have voted for strike action on this issue for a third time, I believe unprecedented in Scotland. And cuts that are imposed by management seem set to try, management seem set to, try to ride this out and are refused and to even respond to requests for dialogue. Employees are telling me, uh, Minister, that their trade unions have been effectively de-recognised at the University of Dundee. This collapse in industrial relations Can I have a is question, unacceptable. Please? Will the Minister contact the Principal again today and urge him to do his duty and get his management to engage in this dispute immediately? Minister. Well, I've already made the point that uh, I'm regularly engaging with uh, the Principal have written uh, this week to uh, request an update to also I urge for the uh, engagement that we would want uh, to see. I will uh, obviously prosecute some of the issues that Mr Mara has uh, laid out if uh, they are um, uh, with any form of foundation. I'm not suggesting uh, they're not. If what he's he hearing is correct, that is a cause for concern. I believe strongly that the trade union voice, the workforce voice, must be heard across the entirety of the labour market. Our universities are no different in that regard, and he can be assured I'll continue to engage with the university on this matter. Question number four, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of reports of increasing hidden hunger due to the cost of living crisis, what action it is taking to address school meals debt and expand access to universal free school meals? Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. We fully acknowledge the steep cost of living uh, rises are putting a huge strain on some families and they are facing many unforeseen challenges. All pupils in primary one to five are publicly funded schools currently benefit from universal free school lunches during term time, whilst free school meals remain for eligible pupils in other age groups after primary five. We are continuing to work with our partners and local authorities to plan for the expansion of free school meal provision to primary six and seven during this parliamentary term. This work is being supported by £30 million of capital funding in this financial year to support expansion of catering and dining facilities. 
We are working with our partners and local authorities to understand the impact of the school meals debt for families. And in the meantime, I would urge all local authorities to continue to do all they can to resolve any payment issues without withdrawing meals from pupils. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that update and I welcome the commitments we've heard this week. But we've seen an anonymous donor donate a generous five-figure sum towards offsetting the school meal debt, so we need the government to cover the rest. But given the cost crisis, we need to go further and faster on the expansion of free school meals. So can the Cabinet Secretary give some dates? When pupils in P6 and 7 can expect this to be in place and when will we see that equality in our secondary schools? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are, as I said, my original answer, working very closely with local authorities to determine what capital work needs to be undertaken to, example, uh, to, for example, increase the capacity within kitchen and dining facilities. And that's the work that is uh, uh, ongoing at the moment. That's been supported, as I said, by £30 million from the Scottish Government. Uh, we are continuing that work with local authorities, but I would, of course, uh, recognise uh, the cost of living crisis is impacting on families. But that's exactly why there is additional uh, support, for example, uh, through the increase to the Scottish Child Payment to £25 from 14th November to current recipients and obviously the opening of applications for under 16s, which will be a welcome uh, uh, additional support for families right across Scotland. Paul McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to expanding free school meal provision, already the most generous universal offer of anywhere in the UK. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the number of free school meal registrations at Scotland schools? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Paul McLennan for that question? Indeed, it is uh, the uh, most uh, expansive provision uh, within the UK nations that we have for universal provision of free school meals. Um, currently, there are uh, over 300,000 pupils registered for free school meals at schools right across Scotland. Question number five, Fiona Hislop. To ask the Scottish Government when it will respond to the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee's report on energy price rises. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I'm keen to provide the committee with as an up-to-date response as possible. Now that we have details of the August price cap from Ofgem and the announcement by the UK Government this morning, I intend to provide the committee with a response shortly. Fiona Hislop. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the report reflects evidence taken in April and May, which stated that even then, that the looming energy price increase crisis had to be responded to at a similar scale as the COVID pandemic crisis by both the Scottish and UK governments. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to improve awareness and access to the advice and advocacy and home installation services it is responsible for, on top of the immediate and welcome targeted financial support with devolved powers and announced by the First Minister, and does he agree that any UK government decision, even at this late stage, to freeze energy prices should be welcomed, a decision which would have happened more swiftly from an independent Scottish government with similar such powers? Cabinet Secretary. Sign off, sir. The, the Commission's report makes a, a number of important recommendations both to the Scottish Government and to the UK Government in the action it's necessary to avert the increasing cost crisis that households are facing due to increasing energy prices. Uh, we've already announced uh, £1.2 million of additional funding to support advice services, uh, to support customers who are experiencing difficulty, alongside a doubling of our fuel insecurity fund to help to support those who are at risk of self-rationing or self-disconnection from the energy network. So we'll continue to look at what further measures we can take forward and reflect on the announcement made by the UK Government this morning. And I can also say to the member, there is absolutely no doubt that we've had a vacuum of any political leadership from the UK Government on this issue for the last two months and in independent Scotland we have been able to move swiftly and quickly to reassure, reassure households on how we would have tackled the cost crisis. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, the report notes that homes that are not connected to the gas grid are often more expensive to heat. Now, given the Scottish Government's drive to get such homes to adopt electric heat pump technology and noting Fiona Hislop's correct request for clear advice to people, can the Cabinet Secretary help me understand the running costs of such technology when compared to fossil fuels in the current market? Cabinet Secretary. So, officer, one of the key things that could be done to help to reduce the cost of electricity is to uncouple it from the wholesale gas price, uh, which is in the powers of the UK Government to do, which would have an immediate impact in bringing down electricity costs for those who are using electric-based heat pumps. 
One of the other measures that the UK Government could take to help to offset the very high costs of energy in rural areas and those who are off-grid is to regulate the oil market, which would help to reduce the cost of heating oil for many households who are dependent upon it. And despite a request for them to do so, they have continued to refuse to make that regulated, a part of the regulated sector. Question number six, Jackie Dunbar. To ask the Scottish Government how the National Planning Framework 4 will help to address vacant, derelict and abandoned buildings and land, including across Aberdeen City. Minister Tom Arthur. We know that vacant and derelict land and buildings are a blight on communities and are challenging to deal with, and often result in local authorities and other agencies bearing the costs to keep them safe. National Planning Framework 4 will change the way we plan our places and support Scotland's journey to becoming a net zero nation. The draft NPF 4, published in November 2021, proposed strengthening national planning policy to prioritise the reuse of vacant and derelict land and buildings to reduce impacts on communities and contribute to climate change targets. We are giving careful consideration to the wealth of views on the draft NPF 4 from both the public and this Parliament to inform the final version. The finalised draft framework will be laid in Parliament once this process is complete. Jackie Dunbar. Scotland has almost 11,000 hectares of vacant and derelict urban land. This means that almost a third of the Scottish population lives within 500 metres of a derelict site. These sites blight communities, harm well-being and limit opportunities, but they could be so much more. Can the Minister outline what action is available to local authorities like Aberdeen City to deal with these sites and can he commit the Scottish Government to continuing to address these sites as a priority? Minister. Well, I, I know as the member will fully understand local authorities can direct development to vacant and derelict land through their local development plan. In our draft National Planning Framework 4, we proposed strengthened national planning policy to prioritise development of vacant and derelict land. If approved by Parliament and adopted, our updated policies in the finalised NPF 4 will directly influence planning decisions. Our £50 million vacant and derelict land investment programme was launched in 2021 to complement our existing investment support for place-based regeneration across Scotland. We are keen for all authorities, including Aberdeen City Council, to work with their communities and other partners to develop suitable project proposals and apply to the programme. Question number seven, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it supports property purchases, direct payment to property owners and the use of non-disclosure agreements as a means of removing objections to large-scale wind farm applications. Minister Tom Arthur. The Scottish Government does not support such measures. Our planning and consenting systems ensure that all relevant parties, including individuals and local communities, can have their say on development proposals, including for large-scale wind farms. It is beneficial for all those with an interest in the proposal to provide their comments where they wish to do so. I cannot recommend that individuals give up their right to comment, but if they choose to do so, then that is a matter for them. Oliver Mundell. I, I thank the Minister for that very clear answer. Make no mistake, such agreements are destroying rural communities, turbocharging rural depopulation and changing the character of our uplands forever. Will the Minister urgently seek a review as to how such impacts are monitored and assessed during the application process? Because sadly, these are becoming the new norm and they are corrupting our planning process. Minister. I thank the member for his supplementary and I am happy to consider um, what he has asked me to do. I would also welcome the opportunity to meet with the member to discuss in more detail, in particular if he can provide evidence of the matters that he has raised. 